So my first go at the Derwent Inktense blocks did not go so well. I wanna try them again. And instead of trying something new, I'm gonna stick to the same old boring because when I try something new, it kind of backfired. So we are drawing a really cute parfait. I've already got it sketched up and I've got reference up. And as I will say a majillion times, there is absolutely zero shame with using reference. If you need reference, you should definitely use it. So I'm gonna grab some indigo and I'm gonna grab some blue. I think that's sea blue or peacock blue, something like that. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna paint the glass. So it's kind of like an underglaze. And I've just been really feeling summery, parfait kind of vibes. So that's what we're getting. I am super ready for summer and delicious fresh fruit and maybe like a trip to the beach or hiking. So this is kind of like all those wishes in one place. And if you are looking for a glass painting tutorial, I actually happen to have one here on this very channel. It is part of an ongoing textures watercolor series I'm doing. So you should definitely check that out. And you should of course check out my other Derwent Intense videos. I firmly believe that we can learn from one another's failures and I heartily encourage you to learn from mine. So it is hot and dry outside. So this is drying very quick. Something to keep in mind with ink tents is once they dry, you can't blend them, you can't move them. They pretty much stay where they are, they are which can make them great for under glazes. It can be frustrating for lifting, that sort of stuff. So I hope you like where you put it because that's where it's gonna be. And I think this time I'm gonna save the background till the very end. Now I've got a tasty little slice of pineapple down here. And I wanna make sure I leave lots of white because I've noticed that um, ink tense tends to be a little chromatically flat just sort of lack some of the nuance that, you know, other types of watercolor may have. And I'm not 100% sure why they do this. I think it has something to do with the, I think they are India ink based. I think that's what makes them permanent. Cannot find anything that 100% backs up such a belief, but I've used both materials, so. I think I do have some basis for believing that, but I've noticed that with India ink based watercolor kind of supplies, they tend to be very one dimensional and lack nuance. So I'm gonna try to leave a lot of white and hopefully that's gonna give us a lot of visual bounce, make it, you know, fun and lively, bouncy, colorful, engaging, all the good stuff. And I am painting with my Inktense blocks Kind of like how I would paint with traditional watercolor. This is just how I'm more comfortable working. I also happen to have Inktense color pencils. I'm gonna use those for details a little bit later on. And I am working right now with the 12 color set, which other than lacking a purple, I think has an excellent range of colors to begin with. And I think that with my intense pencils is probably all I really need. Okay, I'm gonna blend that out just a little bit because I want it to look like it's traveling through the glass. I'm gonna try to do a little more color mixing and wet into wet blending on this one. I did a prior version, I just really did not like it. So this is version two. And I hope I've got it a little more figured out this time. 
I was so frustrated by my failure that I swore I was gonna come back and figure it out. And share both with you guys, because I think it's important that people be aware that even if you fail, even if you're not successful every time, you can still use that, you can still grow from that. Failure is not defeat. And there's gonna be a lot of failure as you're learning and growing and improving. So I want to help normalize that for you guys. We all get discouraged sometimes. But what's important is like conquering it. So hopefully we'll conquer it together today. And if not, well, I'll just have to give it another, another go. Tell you guys though, I could go for a nice fresh fruit parfait. Or even better yet, a nice refreshing smoothie. I think we're already looking a lot better. So this, show you guys, this is my first attempt. It was not quite a success, but I learned a lot from doing it. So I'm applying some of the things I liked about that piece to this piece here. Taking what I learned and moving forward with it. And I am super excited that Derwent is releasing a watercolor version of these or a half pan version. I really look forward to seeing how those differ from these. I hope they differ. I have, there's a few things I don't particularly like about these for like a standalone art supply. I feel like they don't have quite as much depth and nuance as traditional pigment-based watercolors. They remind me a bit of dye-based watercolors in that they're a little flat so you have to really, I feel like you have to really bring something additional. Some way to add texture or just some sort of liveliness because they're not quite, I don't know, they're just missing something. Talk to a couple of other watercolor artists. They kind of feel the same. I know there are watercolor artists who do some really gorgeous work with these. I'm not sure if they're working entirely with these or if they're adding, if they're doing like mixed media or maybe they're adding like a granulation medium or something. But their work looks great and I am still struggling with these. So I want to know their secret. And this time I'm definitely trying to add in some things, add in some interest. Now I should say that I am painting on fluid cellulose watercolor paper. This is the Flu Fluid Easy Block. And I've noticed that some watercolors just really perform better on uh, cotton rag papers, nicer watercolor papers. So that could also be a contributing factor. That was not one of the elements that I changed, but I may continue to kind of experiment until I get these a little more figured out. Now I wanna make kind of a gray color. So I'm mixing two different browns and a little bit of the blue that I mixed originally for the blueberries. And I wanna use that as kind of my shadow for the cream in the parfait. Ooh, I have a little bit of bleeding here, which I like, because it adds just some interest that was otherwise kind of lacking. I may also be working too loose with these. Too much water 
I know some of you guys are probably disappointed that I'm not applying the stick directly to the paper. That'll just have to be another video if I ever work larger and on something nice and textured, I promise. I'll give it a shot. Don't use watercolor crayons often, but I do use them sometimes. So I think these would be my first, what I would grab first. Because they really have a high pigment load. I mean, you do have to do a little bit more. I'm finding I'm having to do a little bit more with them than I would necessarily with traditional watercolors. More to kind of bring some depth in and some interest in. But if I want, say, um, kind of a rough edge, a scrumbled edge, which I may end up doing with this anyway, just to add a little interest and add some like very immediate color. That could be the way to go about doing it. So I ought to consider doing that for this piece. Now the problem is I've been adding water to them, right? And that makes them kind of delicate and kind of, kind of more fragile. So that's, you want to let them dry out before you do that or break them in half and use one half only for watercolor techniques and the other half as a crayon. All right, I'm gonna give this a chance to dry. Okay, so this has had a chance to dry. I'm just kinda looking over it, thinking about what I wanna do. Some of the colors are much mute, more muted. These sort of promise bright, vivid, translucent colors, hmm. I don't know if it's the fact that I'm working on cellulose-based paper and that's kind of muting everything out because that happens sometimes if I haven't layered them enough because that can be also why, you know, colors aren't quite as vivid as they should be because they're just too watered down, not enough contrast. Or if, I don't know, maybe these are not as saturated as I'd hoped. And I'm probably going to have to do some direct application as well. These may not be able, they may not be capable of delivering quite the color load that I so desire without a direct application. It's one of the reasons I both love testing art supplies and I get kind of frustrated is Sometimes it can just be hard to figure out where you need to start when you're troubleshooting why a material isn't performing the way it's advertised or the way you see other people being able to handle it or the way it's worked in the past or even the way you imagine it should be able to work. I mean, we all get these ideas in our head and sometimes reality just doesn't quite live up to that. I mean, it's already better than the last version. <laughs> last version was <laughs> a wild mess. This is already better. I'm just trying to make it as good as it can be. Already though, it sort of seems like some of these get a little muddy when you do too many thin layers. And maybe I'm just doing, maybe this is all tantamount to doing like a bunch of underglazes and maybe I'm just doing too many underglazes and that's what's going on. I'm trying to draw out some of that color so we get a little more blending, add a little more randomness to it. Kind of open it up a little bit. And once this dries, I need to start thinking about how I want to handle the background. Oh, apparently that was wet. And apparently this is wet. So, still sort of thinking about the background. I think maybe something with like really light fuchsia, since we haven't used a lot of fuchsia, but it matches the lead we used would maybe be a good way to go. I don't have to work 
dual wielding because once this is dried, it's not blending out anywhere. So if I want things blended out, I have to work pretty fast. So that could be kind of another problem for these is if you're used to having like a longer open time, these might not provide you with quite the open time you need. Also, when you're working fast, your hand tends to catch on things, or at least mine does, and I tend to make mistakes. Don't have time to necessarily problem solve or think things through the way they need to be considered. So if you're someone who makes mistakes when you have to make impulsive or snap decisions, these could also not be great for you. But if you're somebody who maybe struggles with decision making and you need an outside force to kind of force your hand, these could be an interesting tool for that. Alright, that's starting to have kind of that dirty look to it. So I may have overworked it or it may be that the fuchsia really adds <laughs> that like once I start working in the fuchsia, that might be when it starts going downhill. So that's definitely something to consider. I'm going to let this dry. All right, my friends, I promised you guys some direct application. I've got my Inktense color pencils right here. Hopefully this will allow us to get some nice, bright, direct color since these tend to be, you know, they really pack a punch. So I'm going to start by just kind of trying to add some depth. And I'm pretty much working with the same palette as what came in the Intense 12 piece block set. I'm actually missing some colors. I don't have some direct correlation, so I've just left those out. So I'm actually working with a smaller palette of the pencils. However, I will also be augmenting it with white. Now it is nice not to have, you know, all five layers that were applied previously activate as soon as I activate the top layer. It's nice not having to worry about everything just turning to mud as soon as you try to do a shadow layer. And perhaps one of the problems with, you know, being able to get enough vibrance and uh, color depth is that there's just not enough color mixing going on. Maybe I'm just not doing enough to bring additional colors to the table and maybe I'm kind of relying too much on the ink tents themselves to sort of solve that problem. But I think, I think there's just something about what's being used in these that kind of deadens the color. Like there's something about maybe the binder, it just doesn't react with light the same way. I wonder if the artists who use these more frequently for painting, if they feel the same way or if they found some process that allows them to accommodate for it. I also find that these things get like they leave dust all over the palm of my hand, which is very prone to smearing. I know they've got grippers for that. I'm mostly just pointing it out because if you're like me and as soon as your hands get dirty, it gets every single place all over your work, then that's something to know about. Now I'm using some of the Peacock Blue and it's really intense in the pencil form, which is good to kind of Add some details, tighten up the glassware. And once this all dries, I'll do kind of a shade layer going down.
so the main body has had a chance to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and use sea blue to start doing just a little bit of shading. And you wanna be light, or I wanna be light because, you know, with intense, they tend to be intense. I am noticing some movement though, not as much as I would have if I had used traditional watercolor or traditional watercolor pencils, but still enough that it's worth mentioning. So I use a little bit of the same blue to do a cast shadow for the fruit and for the glass. Finally, I'm gonna go in and add, hopefully add some white details. I'm actually noticing a bit of resistance. Um, it's sort of like the intents have built up a layer or um, I don't know, they've like taken the tooth off the paper surface basically. So it's actually harder to mark on top of it. Which is not necessarily something I've noticed with most watercolors. I mean, you have to really paint thickly with a lot of watercolors to get them to lose their, the tooth of the paper. And I wouldn't say I've painted thick enough for that to actually be an issue. So I may not even be able to use this as much as I'd kind of hoped. However, that's a really important thing to know since it kind of handles how we can use the watercolor. So I guess I'm gonna have to use um, an alternative white, like PH Martin's Bleed Proof White, just to sort of get the white specular highlights that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna let this dry, and then I'll go ahead and do that. All right, so that's had a bit of a chance to dry. I'm gonna go ahead and go in, actually with a very fine point, synthetic, and use this opaque white paint to kind of bring out some of my highlights. It's a little disappointing that I couldn't use the Inktense white pencil to do this. I usually do use it for my carrot pages to sort of add smaller white highlights or to do blended white highlights. It's kind of a shame that it doesn't want to layer on top of its brethren, I guess. Since we pretty much in fact, I think we've only used Intense products up until this stage where I'm just kind of tightening up some of the details and adding some white highlights here and there. So we've basically given these Intense blocks two field tests. I was so determined to make this work. I think we were more successful on the second, and I think we were able to learn a few things. We were able to learn a few ways to handle these, which will kind of allow you to achieve a little more vibrance, a little more brilliance than we were achieving in our first field test. I think it's because even though it's bright and there's a lot of colors, there's not really a lot of color depth. And it's just kind of a lot of mess going on. We also didn't really preserve the white of the paper. With this one, we didn't preserve the white of the paper quite as much. Adding the magenta really dulled this down for some reason, really kind of made it muddy and unexciting. I think if I'd left the background white, it would be, it would have a lot more pop and be more visually interesting. So that is something to consider that the magenta may not be your friend. Um, but we handled the colors a lot better in this piece. And I feel like it's a much more successful little illustration than the other one. And I feel like I handled the rendering much better. Now, I did learn recently that for things like the white color pencil, gotta find it. 
it just doesn't want to go on when you have this many layers. It seems that painting layers of ink tents um, kind of dulls down the tooth on the paper. So I wasn't able to really get enough tooth to make any marks with the white, which is kind of disappointing because it would have been nice to like go in and do very fine tuned sort of highlights. And instead it kind of muddied, dulled the colors down even more. And it does do that on traditional watercolors to an extent, but not as much as it's doing on here. So I still have really mixed feelings. Um, I'm excited about them. They do offer a lot of interesting potentials and they can be really good for people who struggle with their watercolors always turning to mud, but they're not a cure-all and they're not the end-all be-all solution that I was kind of hoping they might be. So I think having a regular set of traditional watercolors with traditional gum arabic or aquazole binders and traditional watercolor pigments is probably the way to go for most. But I also think there's room in most studios for these interesting, not quite crayon, not quite pastel, aqua medium. And I've seen a lot of artists online talk about how much they enjoy using these for mixed media. So there's probably a lot of value there. A lot of artists talk about mixing them with acrylic, which is not something I've tried but could be really interesting for kind of on the spot color mixing, especially with um, like poor acrylics or very liquidy acrylics. These could really be a lot of fun. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope this was helpful, useful, and informative to you guys. And I hope to see you guys again really soon. If you're looking for more watercolor reviews, tips, tricks, and tutorials, check out my watercolor playlist here on this channel. If you're looking for the unbox and swatch, you can find the card earlier in the video. And if you're looking for the first go at the field test, the <laughs> Technicolor vomit disaster that this is, you can find that in the cards as well. If you're looking for more in-depth tutorials, if you've heard me talk about my watercolor comics and you want to know more about that, you can head on over to natasuit.blogspot.com and check out my watercolor basic series. And while you're clicking on links, while you're typing things in, I highly recommend you check out my watercolor comic, 7inch Kara at 7inchkara.com or 7inchkara.tumblr.com. So I look forward to seeing you guys again really soon and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Bye guys.